Okay. I guess we're ready to start then. So, first of all, apologise for any confusion about the uh, my availability this week. Uh, I'm not in Indonesia, which is where I thought I was going to be this week. So, um, what we'll do is recommence topic two, aerosol, and continue by discussing the behaviour of atmospheric aerosol. So in the last lecture we covered the fact that in order to understand the atmospheric aerosol we need to understand something about its nature. So the aerosol have got loads and loads of different sources and lots of processes that take place before they can be measured in the troposphere and before they have the impacts that they will have both on human health and climate, for example. And these comprise both primary sources, secondary sources, uh, they can scatter the incoming sunlight, they can be modified into, uh, into cloud nuclei, they can be removed by dry and wet deposition, uh, and all of these processes take place before we can sample them and find out what it is that we are being exposed to in the atmosphere. So, just by way of recap, the aerosol can comprise a load of primary sources. So, first of all, sea spray. So, how are sea spray aerosol formed? So, what are the three primary mechanisms for sea spray formation? So first of all, the air is entrained into the ocean surface, forms bubbles, the bubbles catch shatter, and these form particles which are the film particles. The film particles are the finest sort of sea spray particles. When the bubble shatters, there's a jet that is formed because of the vacuum that's left over because of the, uh, the bubble cap shattering, and these pinch off and form jet droplets, and then spume droplets are the ones that are formed when spray just gets ripped off the top of waves by high winds. And there's dust, so the dust is formed when the terrestrial surface is dry enough and of the right sort of constitution to have resuspended material blown into the atmosphere. On top of the primary sources are the secondary sources, and if you recall, here is a, an illustration of the nucleation of particles that take place at around one nanometer, as shown by those particles. That's a population of particles that then sometimes can grow, as is shown by these nucleation events of secondary material, which can then form larger particles. So these larger particles mix with the larger primary particles and you end up with a mixture of primary and secondary. So can anybody say what sorts of particles are not included in this schematic because they're ambiguous, they could be primary or they could be considered secondary. That's a, a major contribution to the aerosol, not included in those. Well, combustion-derived particles can be considered primary if they're sampled in the exhaust, so that combustion source, and secondary once they arrive in the atmosphere because they can, take, they can condense from the gas phase into the background atmosphere. So those primary and secondary particles both contribute to the ambient population. So that population has a range of sizes over several orders of magnitude. So you can see there from a nanometer up to 10 microns. The big particles contributing to the main mass, the intermediate particles contributing to the bulk of the surface area, and the finest particles contributing to the highest number. And these are largely secondary particles, but they also stretch into the accumulation mode, and the primary particles are in the large sizes, but they also stretch back. Why is the accumulation mode called the accumulation mode? Because it accumulates. Why does it accumulate in the atmosphere? Because 
because it's got the longest lifetime. Particles don't diffuse very rapidly and they don't gravitationally settle very rapidly. And so this mixture of primary and secondary particulate can be from both natural sources and from man-made sources. So that's the sort of mixture of the particles. So that's the sort of overview you need to have to understand before we move on to how these particles behave. So what are those particles made of? So we saw last time that they can comprise a lot of inorganic components. So what are the main sources of inorganic secondary components? Anyone got any ideas in organic secondaries? Ammonium. So that's directly emitted primary ammonia that can then form ammonium when it's condensed on the particles. What does the ammonium neutralize? Acid gases, so the sulfuric acid and the nitric acid can form ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate or partially neutralized ammonium bisulfate. And what, what are some examples of inorganic primaries? Well, we just saw it on the previous slide. Sea salt, so sodium chloride. Crustal materials, so calcium, magnesium, potassium. And so these can comprise the inorganic components. But there's also a whole bunch of organic components. So what are the primary organic components? Where do they come from? It's there, yeah, but they form secondary organic aerosol. So the VOCs are volatile, so the gases. So the prime, so they, so they form secondary aerosol. What primary aerosol are organic? Bacteria. Black carbon isn't organic. Black carbon is elemental carbon rather than organic carbon. Okay, so there's, there's pollen, there's detritus and debris from soil and the likes, but there's also the combustion particles, which are sometimes considered primary or secondary, if we remember, and they can contain a lot of organics. So these can be sampled. And so how do we know about the sorts of sampling? Well, we measure them. How do we measure particles and what they're made of? Well, we can either collect them, and we collect them through impactors and filters, and then we measure what's on the filter. Or we can measure them online. And the online measurements, they're more modern measurements, they're things like aerosol mass spectrometry, and they can give you a picture of the inorganic and organic components in nearly real time. And they can give you quite high time resolution, which in this black line here, you can see how they or how the organic components fluctuate and they're superimposed upon the lower time resolution of the impactor samples. So you've got online and offline measurements of organic and inorganic components. So we have a picture of the different sources and what, they, what the nature is, what their sizes are, where they come from, and a picture of what they're made of. So if we know where they come from, and we know what they're made of, what else do we need to know? How they behave in the atmosphere. Well, before that, here's an example actually. We have the offline analysis and the online analysis. So what's the best instrument to measure particles? How, what information would you want to have? All right, what's the best instrument to measure the composition? What information would you like to have? We'd like to know every component. Yeah? When would you like to have it? All of the time. What frequency would you like to have it? Very fast. Okay, so all the components, all of the time, very fast. And you'd want to know what size they are. So what instrument can do all of those things? This one, the perfect instrument, yeah? 
Okay. Is there a perfect instrument? No. What instrument do you not want? The useless instrument. Okay. So you don't want the useless instrument, and you want the perfect instrument. So the useless instrument can't measure anything any of the time. The perfect instrument can measure all things all of the time, all sizes. And this plot of acronyms tells you something about how good an instrument is. None of the instruments are perfect. So if none of the instruments are perfect, how do we know, some, how do we know everything about the composition of the aerosol? You have lots of instruments. So there's no perfect instrument, but you've got lots of instruments that can give you more than one of the pieces of information and different overlaps. So the only way to measure all of the atmospheric composition at the moment, because there's no perfect instrument, is to combine lots and lots of instruments. How many people... Right. Let's run down this... OK, how many of these acronyms do we know and understand? Shout, shout out the answer if you know any of these acronyms. So FTIR, what's that? Fourier transform infrared, yeah. OK, so you conduct a Fourier transform on the infrared spectrum, and what information does that give you? OK, absorption spectrum of some gases. What are we trying to sample here? Particles. So what's needed in order to use a Fourier transform infrared? Well, you can use some special FTIR for particles, but some of the time you evaporate the particles and you measure the gases that come off. Any other acronyms? You don't need to know any of them, OK? You don't need to know these acronyms. All you need to understand is that the combination of lots and lots of different instruments can give you the picture that we need. So that tells you how we can measure the composition. It doesn't tell you much about the sources, but if you can guess what sources comprise what components, then we can get a picture of the sources and we can get a picture of the composition of atmospheric aerosol. So once we have this, well, why do we want to know about particles? Why do we want to know about aerosol at all? Because of the health effects and because of their impact on climate and the biogeochemical cycling, for example. So in order to do that, we need to understand how the different components and how the different aerosol behave. So what sort of behaviour might we want to understand? Maybe. Interaction with gaseous VOCs might be one. Interaction with light might be another. Interaction with the human body might be another. Interaction with other gases that aren't even VOCs. So oxidants. But one of the most important ones is the interaction with water. Why is the interaction with water important? Forms clouds, okay, that's one reason. What will water do? So if you have a humid environment, you've got a particle this size, and it moves into a humid environment from a dry environment, it will become bigger, okay? What will happen to the components in this small particle? They will become dilute in aqueous solution. Will Will all components become dilute? If they're not soluble, they won't interact with water very well. So what makes a, a molecule water-soluble? Polarity. Okay? So what is polarity? It's the unequal sharing of electrons between atoms in the molecule. <coughs> so, in water, where do the electrons want to cluster? 
Water, H2O. The electrons cluster around the oxygen atom. Okay, so water. Water is the most abundant semi-volatile gas in the atmosphere. So we know what semi-volatile means? So will somebody give me a definition of what semi-volatile is? It can exist in multiple phases under the ambient conditions. Okay? So it can exist as vapour, it can exist as liquid, and if you get cold enough up in, higher up in the atmosphere, it can exist as ice. So it's a semi-volatile material, and it's a very special semi-volatile material because its triple point is under atmospheric conditions. Do we know triple point? Triple point is the point at which you're in equilibrium between the water, the gas, the liquid, and the gas, and the solid. Okay? So water is a very special molecule for that purpose. And that's why it's essential for life, actually, because of its particular properties. So, what makes a molecule water-soluble, then? We've already said it's polarity. So is ethane water-soluble? It shares its electrons very evenly. So glucose. Okay, so what are the functional groups that make glucose water-soluble? OH. Okay, so you've got lots of hydroxyl groups. So the O has more of the electrons than the H in the OH group. So the O that has lots of electrons around it attracts the H in water, and the H on the OH group attracts the O in water. So you end up in a, when you've got lots of water molecules in a particle, then they will surround the glucose because they like it and put it into solution. So you can have lots and lots of different molecules in a particle and only some of them are solvated. So what's, what's the special term for solvation in water? Do we know? Hydration. So solvation, you can have so any solvent can form a solution. If the solution is with water, it's hydration. And hydration forms an aqueous solution. So most droplets, or most particles, in ambient conditions, because they have water, they are aqueous solutions. So if they're ionic compounds, they will dissociate and form, for example, sodium chloride, will form sodium ions and chloride ions in aqueous solution. If it's glucose, would glucose ionize? Why would it not ionize? Why does glucose not ionize? It hydrates, but it doesn't ionize. Because it's strongly bonded, it's covalently bonded. Because the OH is covalently bonded, and you've got this close sharing of the electrons, you end up with a stable molecule, but a hydrated stable molecule in aqueous solution. So the solvation, and in the case of water, the hydration of an ionic compound means that the individual ions are surrounded by the prerequisite number of water molecules. So what would happen if you haven't got enough water molecules to hydrate your soluble compound? So if you've got some, if you've got a, a cup of tea, yeah, a cup of tea, and you have a very, very sweet tooth, and you keep putting sugar into your tea, does it always carry on dissolving? So why does it not carry on dissolving? Sorry? Become saturated. What does saturated mean? 
It's run out of water. So what does that mean? Why has it run out of water? So if you carry on putting... Wet, so it runs out of water. Oh, I've never had sugar, more than six teaspoons of sugar in my tea. Could I put seven in? Probably not. And it only tastes just as sweet. So if I put more sugar in, it wouldn't taste any more sweet. Okay? Unless I got some solid sugar. But it wouldn't taste any more sweet. So why wouldn't it? Because there are not enough molecules of water to fully surround the glucose molecule. So you would need probably you'd need of the order of 10 to 12 water molecules for every molecule of glucose to fully mobilize and fully take the sugar into solution. So if you haven't got the right number of moles of water for the solution, you cannot get above the solubility limit. What about ethanol? So we all, so if somebody has a bottle of vodka, and they want to make it stronger, and they have a bottle of ethanol, could you just keep adding ethanol to the vodka and give it a solution? Sorry? Ethanol, alcohol. So, so if you have vodka, which is maybe 40% alcohol, could you add 100% ethanol to make it 50%, to make it 60%, to make it 70%? Can, yeah? Yes. So what's the difference between glucose and ethanol? Yes, kind of. So it's called miscibility. There is no solubility limit. Because the ethanol and the water are completely miscible from their 100% water range to 100% ethanol range, right across their mixture, they are completely miscible. So you have different compounds in the atmosphere, those that have a limit to their solubility, and those that have unlimited solubility. And you've got a full range in between. So, if you have, um, is, is there anything that is completely insoluble in water? It's very, very difficult to actually find something that has zero molecules that can be solvated if you have enough water. Okay? To actually have zero molecules. Most of the time you can find that there's a trace component if you have enough water. Water is a very, very good solution. But what happens if you have ethanol in water and something that's less soluble in water? It can become more soluble in the mixture. Okay, so you can imagine you have water plus ethanol. You could then have ethanol plus acetone, acetone plus toluene, toluene plus benzene, and you can end up with a mixture that is fully soluble because you become soluble in each of the other components. So it's not as simple as this, but the main solvent in the atmosphere is water. But you can solubilize things that are insoluble in water because you are mixing other things into the water in the atmosphere. So you have a very, very complicated mixture. So here, if you were putting salt into your tea instead of sugar, you can see that you get, if you've only got this number of water molecules, you don't have enough to fully dissolve it, and you have undissolved sodium chloride still in your aqueous solution. So it becomes a brine solution that's fully saturated and you end up with more than you can dissolve in the aqueous solution. So this gives rise to a very important phenomenon in the atmosphere. So do we all know what deliquescence and efflorescence are? 
So, if you start off in the atmosphere and you have sodium sulfate, ammonium sulfate, sodium chloride, sodium nitrate and ammonium nitrate particles and you start in a dry atmosphere or fairly dry, 50% humidity. And if you increase the humidity, so how can you increase the humidity in the atmosphere? Sorry? Cool the temperature. Okay? Because the saturation vapor pressure of the water goes down and the same amount of water vapor increases the relative humidity. That's one way. What's another way? So you can cool it down, so you can lift it up in the atmosphere, it gets colder and becomes more humid. What's the other way? You can add more water. So you can move the air from the land over the ocean, you get water evaporating from the ocean, it becomes more humid. So you can change the absolute humidity or you can change the temperature. And both of those change the relative humidity. So you take the air that contains the particles from 50% and you increase the relative humidity. At around 57% relative humidity, if you have ammonium nitrate particles, they will start taking up water. Why do they take up water? Because they, on average, can have 2.1 molecules of water for every ammonium nitrate molecule, and that is enough to take them into solution. So you can form an aqueous solution of ammonium nitrate at 2.1 molecules of water surrounding that molecule of ammonium nitrate. So what happens, so which is the next one to, be, to, work, to come into solution? So sodium nitrate will go into solution next when there is enough humidity to surround the molecule with five molecules of water. Sodium chloride will deliquesce next. You keep increasing the humidity and you can see here that ammonium sulfate goes into solution and when you can go up to 90% relative humidity and you still, if your particles are made of sodium sulfate, they won't take up water. So they'll take up water at about 93% relative humidity. So what happens after you get that amount of waters of solvation. So after the deliquescence point, so see here for ammonium sulfate, you've increased your humidity to about 78%, it starts taking on water, that's the saturation point in solution, you have a saturated solution at about 78 to 80%. What happens if you increase the humidity more? Well, the particle's very happy, it'll just take as much water as it likes. Okay, and it'll take the equilibrium amount of water. So, at 85% relative humidity, it has 0.85 mole fraction of water. And 90% relative humidity, it has 0.9 mole fraction of water. So, if you've got a particle of ammonium sulfate at 50% relative humidity, what's the mole fraction of ammonium sulfate? Fifty percent relative humidity, the mole fraction of ammonium sulfate. It's one. Okay? The ammonium sulfate has no water at fifty percent relative humidity, so hundred percent of the moles are ammonium sulfate. When you increase it to seventy eight percent and go up to say ninety percent relative humidity. What is the mole fraction 
of, so of ammonium sulfate at 90% relative humidity. So do we know what mole fraction is? If you've got a solution of I in solvent J, the mole fraction of I plus the mole fraction of J equals 1. Yeah? If I is ammonium sulfate, J is water, at 50% humidity, the mole fraction of ammonium sulfate is 1. At 90%, what is the mole fraction of ammonium sulfate? So what's the mole fraction of water at 90% humidity? So the mole fraction of water. What's the, what's the saturation ratio of water in the atmosphere in the gas phase at 90% relative humidity. So what's its mole fraction? So it's 0.9 of its saturation value. So in equilibrium, the mole fraction is 0.9. Okay? So at 90%, the mole fraction of water is 0.9. So what's the mole fraction of ammonium sulfate? 0.1. Yeah? Because the mole fraction of the ammonium sulfate plus water equals 1. The mole fraction of water is 0.9, so the mole fraction of ammonium sulfate is 0.1. So here's your ammonium sulfate particle at 50% humidity. And its mass, or sorry, its volume is one unit. And it now moves to 90% relative humidity. But it is now only 0.1 of the moles of this particle. So it's only got a tenth of the number of molecules in the whole particle. So it's 100% of the particle is ammonium sulfate at 50%. At 90%, it's only a tenth of the particle. So it means that 9 tenths of the molecules are water which means the particle has grown very much larger. But the molecules of water are much smaller than the molecules of ammonium sulfate. So it's not 10 times as big, but you've just added 90% of the molecules of that particle, which are now water, to the original ammonium sulfate. So in the atmosphere, you get a huge amount of swelling when you're above the deliquescence point. You get no swelling when you are below the deliquescence point. So even if you're at 90% relative humidity and all your particles are ammonium, uh, sodium sulfate, you haven't swelled the particles at all. But if you go to 95%, then 0.95 of the molecules are water. So you have a very, very rapid change. The particles just swell very, very rapidly. So what happens if you've got a mixture of sodium sulfate, ammonium sulfate, sodium chloride, sodium, ni uh, sodium nitrate, and ammonium nitrate? Well, it's just Xi plus Xi plus 1, Xi plus 2, Xi plus 3, etc. So you add the mole fractions at their relative humidity above deliquescence to get the amount of swelling. So at 65%, you'll get some swelling of the, um, uh, of the ammonium nitrate mole fraction, but you won't get any swelling of any of the others. Above 73%, you'll get the ammonium nitrate plus the sodium nitrate, but you won't get any of the others. So what happens is you get stages of taking the water up in the atmosphere. 
So when you're talking about water uptake, it's not just straightforward that every particle takes water up at a value above the relative humidity. It must have enough water above its moles of uh, its waters of hydration. So enough enough molecules to solvate the molecule of interest. So that's an important part of the phenomenon. So, how would you measure that in the atmosphere? So, you use a black box, it doesn't matter what it is, but it's something that sizes the particles at dry. So that might be 20% humidity. And what you'll see is with diameter, you get 100% of the particles at the size that you select with this instrument. If it's wet, so if you humidify, so you might put it over a water bath, put your particles in here, so you might get to 90% humidity, so you have a, a bit of heat under here, you make the air moist, you can grow the particles to a bigger size. You DP wet divided by DP dry can be something called the growth factor. So how much it grows. So if if your wet DP was 70% humidity and your particle was sodium chloride what would your growth factor be? We refer to this diagram. What's the growth factor of sodium chloride as 70% humidity? So if you had a 100 nanometer particle of sodium chloride, what size would it at uh, 50% humidity? What size would it be as 70% humidity? So, sodium chloride is the blue one. So, at 70% humidity, it hasn't grown anything. So, the growth factor is 1. So, what will your growth factor of sodium sulfate be at 85% humidity? Sodium sulfate doesn't deliquesce until 93 so its growth factor at 85 is 1. So it hasn't grown at all. But if you measure the growth factor of ammonium sulfate at 90% humidity, its growth factor would be the point, the, the point at which it's grown to with about 20 moles of water for every mole of ammonium sulfate. So you can say something about the composition of the particles by the growth factor. So if you know what the humidity is, and you know how much it's grown from dry to wet, so the DP wet divided by DP dry, it can tell you something about the particle composition. But if you've got a mixture, say you put in A black carbon particle. <laughs> Let's call it a black carbon particle and a sodium chloride particle. Both of them are 100 nanometers. And your black carbon particle, and you are putting them through 90% humidity. 
What's your growth factor of black coal? Does black carbon like water? Okay. So what's the growth factor of black carbon in 90% humidity? One. What's your growth factor of sodium chloride particle? It's more than one, isn't it? So 90% humidity, you can see that sodium chloride starts taking on water at about 73%. So your sodium chloride particle would grow. So your black carbon particles would be there and your sodium chloride particles might be there. So the fraction of particles that don't grow and the fraction of particles that do grow tells you something about the mixing state. So how much they've grown, this value divided by this, tells you something about the composition. How many particles don't grow, or how many particles grow a little bit, and how many particles grow a lot, tells you something about the mixing states. So, you can imagine that if you've got a dry, water-insoluble particle, it won't, grow any, it won't grow at all, so the initial dry diameter is the same as the wet diameter. If it's slightly soluble, or it's got some soluble components in your particle, it will grow a little bit. And if it's highly soluble, it can grow a lot. So it's important to know how particles interact with water vapour, both for their climate effects, for scattering and cloud formation, but also because you can use how much a particle likes water in order to measure something about the atmospheric behaviour. So the growth factor, okay, is a measure of hygroscopicity. Have you heard the term hygroscopicity? So a more hygroscopic particle can better act as a cloud seed. A less hygroscopic particle will act very poorly as a cloud seed. So what things affect hygroscopicity? Well, it can be the water solubility. It can be the morphology. Because if, you, if the water cannot see all of the components, if they're held in an insoluble crust, so if there's soluble material on the inside of insoluble material, you can't actually, the water won't see it. And so, also, have you heard anything, something called the Kelvin term? Does anyone know anything about the Kelvin term? Okay, so it's dependent on the curvature of the particles. So, will small particles take up water better or worse than large particles? Small particles will take up, right, they'll take up much less water because they're much smaller. So the size of the particles, the morphology and the composition will all tell you something about the, will all be informed by measurements of the growth factor. So the hygroscopicity will be determined by those sorts of things. But of course you can have different sorts of mixtures. So you don't know whether everything behaves exactly as you think it would. So you could have some things that are partially soluble surrounding insoluble cores with some completely soluble material and then it will grow to an amount that is the average of all of those components. Right, so here's some real measurements. So these are real measurements of particle hygroscopicity. So what do you think, so this here is time, so along the bottom axis is time. Along this axis is the growth factor. 
This value here is the dry size. So above each panel is the dry size of the particle. So we start, this instrument starts off measuring 25 nanometer particles, so small particles. And you can see that most of the particles have a growth factor of about one. So what does that say? If you go back to this. What does it say about your particle? It's got low hygroscopicity. So if it's got low hygroscopicity, it can be that it's a very small particle. So you can see here that the 25 nanometer particles, in general, have a lower hygroscopicity than the 50, the 35, which in general is lower than the 50, which is in general lower than the 73, lower than the 109, lower than 166, etc. So that gives you an indication of the Kelvin term. Okay? Because the smaller particles are generally lower hygroscopicity. But what else do you see here? Well, you see that some of the particles have a growth factor more than one. So some of the particles grow, most of the particles don't grow. So it's showing that most of the particles have low hygroscopicity because they're fairly small, but some of the particles grow more than one. So they, they're soluble material. If you look at the 35, you can see that there's a gap between the smallest growth and the larger growth. You can see that they start to, they start to separate more. At 50, they're separating even more. At 73, they're separating even more. At 109, they're separating more. So this is saying that the soluble material grows more as the particles get bigger. But there's still a fraction that don't grow at all. There might be things like black carbon. Okay? So a fraction of the particles don't grow, but the fraction that do grow, grow more as the particles get bigger. Until you get to something like 360 nanometers, and there's not, no data here, and you can see that there aren't very many particles that don't grow at all at the largest size. So 360 nanometers, most of them grow. And by 440 nanometers, when we've got data, they've almost all grown. So it shows that there isn't very much insoluble material in larger particles. So most of the insoluble material is in the small particles. So where is this? Well, this was downwind of Manchester. So these data were taken somewhere in the Pennines in a westerly. So the air was coming from, from the west coast of the UK, came across Manchester and picked up pollution particles from Manchester and these were measured about 20, 30 kilometres east of Manchester. And you can see it's very, very spiky. So it's saying there's a lot of variability in the pollution that came out of Manchester, in the behaviour of the particles in terms of their water uptake. So just look at this picture for a minute, look at the main features, and look at this. So look at the difference. So what are the main differences there? Okay, most of them grow. There's almost no low hygroscopicity particles here. Now these were measured in Tenerife, but they were measured in Tenerife. Do you know where Tenerife is? You went there, didn't you? Or you're going there? You're going there. Okay. So these were measured in Tenerife as the wind 
moved from Europe. So this, these were in a northerly, so it took polluted air from Europe, but the air had got a few weeks old, or at least several days old. But there are almost no particles that don't take up water. So what is this saying about the behaviour of the atmospheric particles? Not just grow, they become more soluble. Because these are the same sizes as this. Yep. So these are the same particles, same particle sizes. Dry size, 35 nanometers, 35 nanometers. But there are no particles that are insoluble. So that says that with age and with time in the atmosphere, your insoluble material turns to soluble material. What's another explanation? Okay, so you could lose the insoluble particles. So which particles last longest in the atmosphere? Soluble ones or insoluble ones? Yeah. So how would you lose the insoluble ones most? Because wet deposition would remove the soluble ones. So it's unlikely that the insoluble ones are removed and it's much more likely that the insoluble ones are changed to soluble particles. So do you understand everything so far? Or is it too complex? Do you want me to recap anything? You've probably never seen these sorts of data before. So if you haven't seen these data before, do you want me to recap, explain anything more? Any questions? Okay, we'll move on. Okay, so what we have here is the hygroscopicity with changing size in the polluted environment and in the aged or clean environment. And you can see all the particles grow to quite a lot in the cleaner, more aged environment. Now this picture here is a size distribution of the particles. And the colours are the growth factor, so the solubility of the particles. So the light colours are more soluble and the dark colours are the least soluble. Okay? So this is downwind of Manchester and this is in Tenerife. So what are the differences? You can see from the polluted case on the left hand side that you have a lot of small particles that are insoluble. Well, we already know that. There's a lot of small particles that are insoluble. Yep. And fewer, a smaller fraction of them, grow a little bit. As you get bigger particle size, more of the particles grow by more. So more of the particles become soluble. So that when you're here, even though you haven't got very many particles, most of them are soluble. But look at the scales. This is 20,000 and this is 2,000. So you've got much smaller number of particles in the cleaner marine environment, in the outflow from Europe, so it's been diluted. So not only have your insoluble components been changed to soluble components. You've had all your particles diluted. You've lost most of your small particles. And most of the particles are hygroscopic. So that tells you something about what happens to particles in terms of their water 
solubility as they become older in the atmosphere. So why is that important? Who cares about that? Which, which particles will be better cloud droplets? So the ones, most of the ones in Tenerife, fewer of the ones downwind of Manchester. Which ones will be nastier for your health? Small ones that penetrate deep in the lungs, ones that are made of nasty organic material that might get in there, which wouldn't take up very much water. So pollution particles. So this tells you something about, this behaviour tells you something about whether they are good or bad for health, good or bad for climate, tells you something about their composition, tells you something about their mixing state. So it's all very important sort of things to measure in the atmosphere in order to tell you about lots of parts of the behaviour of atmospheric aerosol particles. That's quite an important thing to understand. So these are just animations of these. So that's Manchester, downward of Manchester. This is Tenerife. So first of all, here's the time of day. Okay? What can you tell me about these? So this, this here is just an average. This is an average. These are animations through the time of day. And this is just the logarithmic plots on the right and linear plots on the left. These are the dry sizes and these are the wet sizes. So let's just look at the top left panel. What's it doing? Why is it doing that? Where do the particles come from downwind of Manchester? What are the sources? Traffic. So when is there most traffic? Rush hour drives the traffic, but you also have to move the air down, so you need enough wind to move it down. But generally the wind speed was fairly constant. But what you can see here is that this diurnal pattern where you get more pollution particles at times of day that correspond to high traffic flow gives you a lot of variation in the number of particles. And this is variation of particles that don't grow very much. So this is combustion aerosol, organic compounds and white carbon that don't grow very much. There's not so much movement in the more hygroscopic particles at a larger size. So a lot of those are coming from the background from Manchester. Those more hygroscopic ones are already quite old. They're coming into Manchester. On top of that, you have all these particles that are coming from Manchester that are contributing to the air. Contrast this plot here. You've still got the time of day here. But the particle size distribution is about the same. You've almost got the same sort of number of particles all day long. And they've all got about the same hygroscopicity all day long. And you've got no fine particles. So you don't have all of those sources. So you don't have all of the pollution sources. You just have this aged background of more hygroscopic particles that all take up water. So, we have this picture here. So we have this picture here of different components take on water at different relative humidity. The particles, dependent upon what they're made of, will swell to a different size depending on, well, a number of criteria which can be dependent upon the initial size, the composition, and the morphology. The different sizes 
will have different mixing states, so the separation between the insoluble and soluble and the amount of insoluble particles will change as a function of size. That will depend upon whether you're in the clean background or the polluted environment, and you'll have much smaller particles made of less soluble material in the polluted environment than you will in the aged environment. And there'll be a strong diurnal signal when you're near to source than much stronger signal than when you're further downwind from source. So does everyone have a feel now for what the atmospheric particles are doing? So if we go back to the beginning, and we have the pollution source, where the air is moving through the atmosphere with a long chemical lifetime, and you have the removal and the conversion and the modification to cloud condensation nuclei. All of this time, these pollution particles are becoming mixed with other components in the atmosphere and are becoming aged to take on soluble material so that by the time they're removed from the atmosphere or transported a long distance, they look very different in their chemical composition and their behaviour to how they are when they're emitted. So they don't carry the same nature. So last week's lecture and the week before, we were talking about the nature of aerosol, which is what they're made of, where they come from, what their mixing state is. That all changes because of the processes and the behaviour changes with time in the atmosphere. So are we all comfortable with that? So if I asked you to write an essay on that, would you be able to describe it all? Yeah? Okay, write a one-page essay on that then. Because it would be really important for you to be able to describe that so that it's clear in your head. So I've given you pictures. I'm not going to mark it, so you don't have to do it. But I would suggest it would be very important for you to be able to write and describe that sort of story to yourself. Because that's what happens in the atmosphere. The real measurements, and that's how we go about measuring the changes in the composition and the changes in the behaviour. So how do they change? So what happens? Why do they change? What is physical aging? Take a particle here, hits another particle there, changes, well, if you've got component A and component B, then the new particle has A plus B. Very simple, coagulation. What's condensation? If something is above its vapour pressure, it can condense on the particles. So if you've got a semi-volatile gas, and we all know what semi-volatile is, don't we? Semi-volatile is something that can exist in both phases. If you've got semi-volatile gas and you give it a surface, it's going to condense. So you can con collide particles together and they become a new particle. They'll be bigger and they'll have more components. Or you can add gases to them and that material will become solid or liquid from the condensation of the gases. So this can, both of those can add more soluble material and increase the overall solubility and hygroscopicity. Chemical ageing. It's a bit more subtle, this. So what might you do to change the solubility and the chemical characteristics and the behaviour of aerosol particles? What sort of atmosphere have we got? What, what's, what's, the big, what's the most abundant reactive gas in the atmosphere? Oxygen. So what sort of environment have we got? An oxidising environment. Okay? If we've got an oxidising environment, what sort of molecules are 
more soluble. Polar ones. So if you can add oxygen to something which is more electropositive, you can have a, an unequal sharing of the electrons and you can make something more polar. So chemical modification, so oxidation, can lead to something becoming more polar. If oxidation gives you added oxygen to an organic compound, it becomes more soluble. If it's more water soluble, it grows more, the particles more hygroscopic, and that's what we see in the atmosphere. So we don't see things becoming less hygroscopic, we only see things becoming more hygroscopic. So that can change the aqueous solubility of the organic compounds. So these depend upon both the chemical and the physical nature of the aerosol particle before it's processed. So if something's already oxidized, can you oxidize it again? Possibly not. If it's oxidized, if it's already got as much oxidized, if it's as oxidized as it can be, it won't be ready to be oxidized again. So it depends upon what it originally, what it is before it starts changing. And it depends upon the gas phase concentrations, the amount of oxidants, the ambient conditions, etc. So physical aging, coagulation. So if you've got a tiny particle and a big particle, but that tiny particle collides with the big one, what happens to the big one? It changes in mass by a little bit. If you've got two similar sized particles, they can change by a lot. So you've got all of the different sizes. You've got everything from one nanometer particles up to 10 micron particles colliding with each other all of the time. So you'd calculate that from Brownian collisions and you can calculate the coagulation rate as a function of size and as a function of number. And what happens, it doesn't just change the sizes, coagulation mixes the components. So if you've got an ammonium sulfate particle colliding with a sodium chloride particle, you, have, you can have sodium sulfate, you can have ammonium chloride, you can have sodium chloride, ammonium sulfate, it can become a mixture of components. So not only do you add the size, you increase the size, you increase the complexity of the chemical composition. So coagulation changes both things, the composition and the size. And what happens, if you have loads and loads and loads and loads of different particles of different sizes, the longer you leave them in a mixture, the more they become the same. If you've only got time for one collision, you only change it a little bit. If you've got time for 10,000 collisions, then almost everything has a chance to collide with almost everything else. And so it becomes more similar with time. So we saw that in that picture of hygroscopicity, didn't we? So instead of everything having a very, very big range of hygroscopicity, everything had a chance to collide and become very similar. And they became very similar and more hygroscopic. So these are probably not going to work. Oh, it does. Yes. So, you see here, in a capillary tube, you give a little bit of force and those particles coagulate. Here, same capillary tube, different particles. One coagulates and the others just bounce. Okay. Here, you've got different sized particles colliding with a bigger particle here. And they're all coagulating. And then you change the pressure and they come back out again. Okay. So you can see the behavior of particles. Some of the same size will coagulate happily. If you've got an oil drop and a water drop and they hit each other, they can, yeah, I don't want to be with you and they bounce off. So again, if they're immiscible, 
and they don't want to be together, they won't coagulate. But if they want to be together, then they can almost stick with a probability of one. So every collision leads to a mixture and a growth. So it's important to realise that you've got all of these processes going on that can make things more similar in the atmosphere. And if you look at this one, does this give you a reason why you're losing lots of the small particles? So in the near field, they can be removed by processing as they become more and more mixed with more similar compounds. So you'll lose the number of particles and they can become more hygroscopic. So the boring stuff now, calculations. How do you add, how do you calculate how big a particle will be if it coagulates with another one? If you've got a 5 nanometer particle and a 10 nanometer particle, what's the size of the new particle when it joins together? Sorry? The total volumes will change. So you just add the volumes. So what's the volume of the sphere? Four thirds pi r cubed. Okay, so four thirds pi d over two cubed times density is the mass. Okay, so all you do if you want to calculate the new particle size is add the volumes and then recalculate the, si the diameter. Now that's always assuming that everything's spherical. Now of course everything isn't spherical, but on average, everything averages out to be a sphere. Okay, and that's the assumption that everybody makes in coagulation. So what happens is that the particle size distribution, you can see here, diameter here, number here, coagulation reduces the number and increases the size. So as well as making everything more similar in composition, when you collide two particles, they become one, so the number goes down. You collide two particles, it becomes bigger, so the size goes up. So coagulation reduces number, increases size, and you just add the volumes. So is that clear? Very simple geometry. And that's a fairly straightforward assumption. It's a little less straightforward to calculate co uh, the condensation rate. So the condensation rate, what does the condensation rate depend on? Any ideas what drives gases to want to condense onto particles? Saturation vapour pressure is one thing. Okay, so if your saturation vapour pressure, if you've got lots of gases, above the vapour pressure that exists above the particle, so if you have, let's, let's go back to water, it's quite an easy example. If the mole fraction of the ammonium sulphate is point two, what's the mole fraction of water? in that aqueous solution. Point A. If you're at 90% humidity, what's the saturation ratio? At 90% humidity, saturation ratio, which is P divided by P0, equals 0.9. If you've got 0.9 saturation in the gas phase, and you've got 0.8 mole fraction in the particle, the water vapour is going to want to condense until the mole fraction is 0.9. Okay? So it will keep condensing gas phase to particle phase until you reach a saturation ratio. So it's dependent upon the saturation vapour pressure. What else does it depend on? <laughs> 
condensation rate. So the rate of, so here it will be the D H2O in the gas phase by DT equals minus D H2O in the aqueous phase by DT equals so what does this is the this is the rate of condensation from a 0.9 saturation ratio to a 0.8 mole fraction until it reaches 0.9. But how fast will that happen? Well, if you look at the slide here. This has got a term, this is the vapour pressure difference. So it's the P minus P naught. So the P over P naught is 0.9 here. It's 0.8 here. So um, I don't want to do this. This is just the difference in the saturation ratio, between the saturation ratio and um, the partial pressure above the particle. So that's the, the thermodynamic part of it. The second part of it, this C times alpha, the alpha says if you have 10 molecules colliding and only nine get in, the alpha equals 0.9. That's a sticking probability. So it's the probability that a collision will be successful. Okay? So the accommodation coefficient or sticking coefficient or uptake coefficient is just the probability that a collision will be successful in condensation. The other term is the rate of molecular collisions. So it's the number of collisions, the number of collisions times the probability of a successful collision times the difference between the gas phase concentration and the saturation value above the surface. That tells you what the condensation rate is going to be. So if this is, instead of 0.8, if, if this is only 0.15, and this is 0.85, would the condensation rate be faster or slower? It'd be slower, because the difference between 0.9 and 0.85 is twice as small as the difference between 0.9 and 0.8. So it'd be half the speed. Okay? If it was 0.7, it would be quicker. So it'd be one and a half times as fast. So, dependent upon the, the particle itself that you're condensing to, dependent upon the gas, gas phase concentration, you will have a faster or slower rate. The sticking coefficient. If you've got water and you've got oil drops, what's the likelihood of a successful collision? Is it going to be lower or higher than to ammonium sulfate? It's going to be lower. So this sticking coefficient depends upon whether something is miscible. So the condensation rate is determined by whether something wants to be with something else and what the difference is between the vapour pressure over the particle and what's in the gas phase. What about the collision rate? What does the collision rate depend upon? Gas kinetics. Dependent upon the temperature, pressure, it's just a, a simple gas kinetic expression. So if something's hotter, you have more collisions. But if something's hotter, you also have a change in the saturation vapour pressure. So you might imagine that this relative humidity would go down. So the number of collisions might go up, but the thermodynamic driver might go down. So what about condensation? What does it do to the distribution? 
If you've got 10 particles and you condense gases onto them, they just grow bigger. So it does nothing to the number. The number stays the same, but the particles get bigger. So again, you just add the particle size, the volume of the particles, or the mass of the particles, to the mass of the condensed gas. And that gives the new mass of the particle, which gives you the new diameter of the particle. <laughs> so, coagulation decreases the number, increases the size. Condensation keeps the number the same and increases the size. So, we've looked at our size distribution from the polluted environment to the aged, cleaner environment. And we've now looked at two processes that can change the distribution and change the composition, coagulation and condensation. Coagulation reduces the number, increases the size. Condensation keeps the number the same, but increases the size. Is it all clear? Clear but complicated. All straightforward and boring. Hands up for who thinks it's straightforward and boring. Okay. You don't need to come next week then. Fairly straightforward. What other processes can change the solubility? So here is an example where you do not change the gas phase concentration. You do not change the number, pop, uh, the number population, but you do change the hygroscopic growth. And this is a chamber experiment where particles that are the same size, uh, sorry, particles of a given size are all shown to increase in hygroscopicity. So again, this comes back to the point where we were talking about changing the chemical composition in an oxidising environment. So if you're actually changing the polarity of the material inside the particle, you change its affinity for water. So you've got condensation, coagulation, and a chemical ageing, which can all change the hygroscopicity, and all lead to the observations that we see. What about clouds? What's the special case of clouds? What do, what do clouds do that other chain that, that doesn't happen anywhere else in the atmosphere? To the composition and the particle distribution. So what's the difference between a cloud and a non-cloud air parcel? So if you take a take an air, take a take a cloud-free air parcel and lift it up, what happens? Just gets colder, increases the humidity, crosses the saturation line and becomes liquid. Because it does that, if you're more than 100% humidity, what's the equilibrium mole fraction of water? If you're more than 100%. If you're more than 100%, what's the mole fraction of water in a cloud droplet? Does that mean there's no particles in a cloud? No, no non-particles? So what? It means that there is no equilibrium. Clouds are not in equilibrium. Clouds cannot reach the equilibrium position. Because if they did, they would have a mole fraction greater than one. Because they're supersaturated with respect to water. So they're more than 100% humidity. It means their mole fraction would have to be 100%. Or greater than, the mole fraction would have to be greater than 0.1. To be greater than 0.1 is impossible. So therefore, they cannot be in equilibrium. So what stops clouds from being in equilibrium? So they scavenge all of the water vapour. How do they scavenge all of the water vapour? They just get bigger. So the droplets get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until all of the water vapour turns into liquid water. 
So if they become bigger, what happens to the, the solute concentration in the droplet? It becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. It becomes more and more dilute. So if you're more dilute, it means that you can suck up more gases. Because you're much bigger, your vapour pressure of the gas above the droplet becomes smaller, and so you can drive more molecules of a gas into the droplet. So you have lots and lots of components that can all A, B, C, all of the chemical components can all drive into the droplet. What happens when your cloud disappears? So what way, how, how does a cloud disappear? Okay? So it evaporates or it rains. Either evaporates or rains. What happens to all of the stuff that's gone into the cloud droplets when it rains? Okay. Goes to the ground. What happens when it evaporates? Well, it either, if either the compounds that have been taken into the liquid water droplet can stay in the particles, or those can evaporate again. So it depends what happens. It depends what happens inside those droplets. And those little droplets, every droplet can act as its own little chemical reactor, its own little aqueous chemical reactor. So if you scavenge sulfur dioxide, for example, they can react with peroxides in the cloud droplet and turn to sulfate. And so when the droplet evaporates and the water comes away, you're left with more sulfate on your particle than you originally had. So every time a particle goes into cloud, it turns to a droplet, it has the chance to add more material. So if there's nitrate in there, or there's peroxide, or ozone, these can all be scavenged by the cloud droplet. And when the water vapour goes away again, either those ozone and peroxide and sulfur dioxide can go out again, or if they've reacted, they can stay in the particles. So every cloud pass, you have a chance to change your size distribution. So you go through these cycles, and you go through these cycles a number of times, and your, your pH can change, you can scavenge different droplets, you can cycle through the ice phase, you can have different sorts of chemical reactions, and all of these things can lead to changes in the particle distribution. So the particles that you go in with are not necessarily the same as the particles that come out. So this mixing state can change, and the size can change, and the composition can change. And what this does, it leads to a jump. So, we have coagulation, which leads to a reduction in number and an increase in size. Condensation, which keeps the number the same and grows the size. And cloud processing, which takes particles that look a bit like this. Some of them are scavenged and rained out. Some of them grow and jump across this to give you a dip. And this was a plot from a paper by a guy called Hoppel who discovered this, and it's called the Hoppel dip. So this dip describes what a size distribution looks like when it changes from one that's been cloud-free to one that's been through a cloud. So the particles can grow and change in composition just by passing through a cloud. So coagulation, condensation, chemical aging and cloud processing can all change your hygroscopicity and mixing state distribution from what you see in a polluted environment to what you see in the clean environment.
Okay, let me... Okay, let's start with this one. Perhaps. Not what, doesn't want to start. Ah. Oh, this is no good. Right, I've lost two of my key animations here. Um, bear with me. So here is the relative humidity in an environmental scanning electron microscope. I want this to keep repeating. It's not going to do it, is it? So it's six and a half degrees and the low relative humidity, the particles can be seen to be dry. When you reach the deliquescence point, they become aqueous solutions. And swell until the mole fraction equals the relative humidity. So deliquescence point gets to the deliquescence point, as we've already seen. So dry, up around deliquescence, reaches 74 and a half, becomes an aqueous droplet. So it's got enough waters of hydration around the deliquescence point. Oh, fantastic. Now it's impossible to stop it. <laughs> okay. So, As we, show, as we showed before, when you've got enough waters of crystallization, so that's waters of hydration, so solvent of solvation, you can go from a crystalline state to an aqueous state. And anything beyond that relative humidity will increase its volume such that you become more and more dilute. And when you get above 100%, you become infinitely dilute and you become a cloud droplet and you just compete until there is no more water vapor. This, uh, no, I'm not going to. These are the Gibbs free energy and the saturation, yeah, um, and the entropy. I'm not narrow. These are the relative mole fractions of individual components at a given relative humidity, but accounting for the water activity and non-ideality. Are you, are you familiar with the concept of non-ideality? Right, I'll come back to that next week. I'll put some slides up for that then. Okay, um, let's assume it's just mole fraction at the moment. But what happens when you start reducing the relative humidity? So if you go from 90% and you've got an aqueous particle, what happens when you come to 80% again? So you start drying the particle. Anyone any ideas? So what happens at 80%? If you... If you have ammonium sulfate and you get more and more moist, above 78% it starts taking on water and becomes an aqueous ammonium sulfate droplet. If you start drying it again, what happens at 80% again? Nothing. So why does nothing happen? 
Anyone? What happens is you don't get past a phase transition until you reach a much, much lower relative humidity. So this is the deliquescence point, and in this direction of increased humidity, you reach this deliquescence where you become liquid. As you go back down, as you dry, you overshoot this point, and you don't become a solid again. What relative humidity do you become a solid again? it's undefined. Why is it undefined? Does anyone know why you, it's difficult to predict when something becomes a solid again? What happens is that you need to nucleate a new phase. <clears throat> so this nucleation of a first order phase transition is a statistical, it's something called a stochastic phenomenon. Do you know what stochastic things are? There's a probability associated with whether something is going to be wet or dry. So it means that if you do it under very, very stable conditions, and very, very slowly, you can go down to a much, much lower relative humidity than if you do it under agitated conditions. Has anyone ever seen the situation where you can take a bottle of water and you can take it down to minus 8 degrees? And then, if you give it a shock, it instantly turns to ice. That's because you are initiating the nucleation of ice crystals by imparting a shock to the system. If you had no particles in the atmosphere, you could lift them, you could lift an air parcel much, much higher than 100% humidity. You could probably get up to about 40% supersaturation before you would homogeneously nucleate water. So particles in the atmosphere are initiating this first order phase transition to form droplets at much, much lower relative, at much, much lower supersaturations. So similarly, if you've got a very stable condition and very pure particles, you can go to very, very much lower relative humidities before they become solid. Does anyone know what this region here is called? Between the deliquescence point and the efflorescence point. It's metastable. So this metastable, that's a metastable regime. So it means it only takes a very small knock to the system to go back to its stable equilibrium position, which would be the dry particles. So you can go through, you go up to 78 to 80% and you form the aqueous solution. If you're continuously shaking it, if you went back down, you would almost, you'd reach not much lower than 80% and you would become a crystalline solid again. In a very stable environment, you can go to much, much lower relative humidities before the particles become solid again. And so this phase transition leads to different morphologies being seen if you look at, for example, an environmental SEM image of particles that contain deliquescing and efflorescing material. So the onset of crystallization is something called heterogeneous nucleation, if it's around something that is already solidified. If it's around something that isn't already solidified, it's called homogeneous nucleation. I won't discuss the energetics and the thermodynamics of the phase transition. But what I will do is mention a little bit about how 
how organic components will behave during this phase transition. So you can have organic components that can stop the water uptake because they can form a film around aerosol. So if you've got a molecule that has a lot of oxygen on one end but has got a lot of carbon down the other end, part of the molecule might be soluble and part of the molecule not soluble. So what happens to that at high relative humidity? Part of it is solubilized, but the other part isn't. So you can end up with a molecule sticking out of a particle with the soluble head and the insoluble tail sticking out. And if you have enough of those molecules, they can stop the water uptake to the particle. So those sorts of molecules form surface films around particles. Surface films can inhibit the water uptake of particles. You can also get something, has anyone heard of micelles? Micelles are the opposite. So you can have lots of organic roots with no oxygen sticking out of an aqueous droplet and the oxygenated head solubilized inside or I mean, you've probably seen this. If you take, if you take oil and water and shake it in a test tube or a beaker, you form little globules of oil inside your water. But in organic mixtures in the atmosphere, you can have molecules that have soluble heads with insoluble tails forming little globules inside the particle. Or they can be on the outside of the particle with the oxygenated head and the organic tail sticking outside. Both sorts of arrangements have been seen in the atmosphere. And if you look under an electron microscope, you can see the particles look a bit like that. And these are just some of the... I'm not going to discuss this. This was a an experiment from right bad slide this one's not my slide I'm trying to trying to make sense of it but this this was the sort of picture that was seen from particles that exhibited this sort of morphology based around organosulfate compounds that were in the atmosphere and these sorts of this sort of behavior has been studied in the lab using dicarboxylic acids, which are also compounds that are frequently found in the atmosphere. So these can interfere with your deliquescence and efflorescence behaviour. If you've got mixed multi-component particles, then they won't behave in a clean way, in the same way as inorganic compounds will with deliquescence and efflorescence. Right, what I'm not going to do I'm going to leave it here because the next set Right, the next set of discussions we're going to talk about some of the thermodynamics that describe this behaviour So what I want you to do before two weeks time is have a look at the problems that are at the end of this presentation. So this just tells you a little bit about calculations of the equilibria that are taking place. These are very simplistic and simplified examples, but these are ways that we actually treat the equilibrium 
in aqueous aerosol. But what I want you to do is have a pretty good recap of the behaviour that we discussed at the beginning of the lecture because that's quite important to underpin the thermodynamic behaviour that we're going to be describing. Okay? Everyone clear? Good, good. See you next time. Has anyone got the reader? Does somebody have the reader? Has it been passed around? Does uh, everyone use it? Thanks very much.
三个月一起